Hi, in this video, we're going to talk about the choroid plexus and the CSF system. CSF stands for cerebrospinal fluid. Cerebrospinal fluid is circulating all around our brain and even in the spinal cord. And it works like a protective cushion which protects our brain from any kind of mechanical damage. Imagine somebody is hitting you hard in the head or you are hitting your head in a rod. In that situation, your brain is sitting inside your cranial cavity and your brain does not dash around your cranial cavity. Because the CSF system is protecting your brain and preventing from any kind of mechanical damage. But other than protecting from any kind of mechanical damage or maintaining the intracranial pressure, the cerebrospinal fluid and choroid plexus system has many other role to play. It turns out that cerebrospinal fluid has many growth factors and microRNAs which helps in neurogenesis and maintains the progenitor state which would be important for producing neurons in the brain. Now, cerebrospinal fluid is not mixed with the blood because there is a blood CSF barrier and the choroid plexus epithelial cells form the blood CSF barrier which is very similar to the blood brain barrier and this blood CSF barrier ensures that harmful substances does not enter the brain. Choroid plexus also works like a gateway for immune system in the brain. Especially macrophages and any other immune system invade the brain via choroid plexus. Other than that, choroid plexus has been an important fluid for a disease biomarker or for disease diagnosis. In case of many neurodegenerative diseases and bacterial or fungal infections, the CSF biomarkers would be a good thing to diagnose. Now let's look at the choroid plexus and the, lat and the ventricular system in the brain. Now we know that inside our brain there are three ventricles and the CSF flows from the lateral ventricle to the third ventricle via the foramen of Monroe. From the foramen of Monroe, from the third ventricle, the CSF travels the fourth ventricle from the cerebral equiduct. And this is how the whole, from in the whole brain, the CSF is circulated. Now the CSF is produced from the choroid plexus, which is an epithelial tissue lined by several blood vessels. And that's why the name plexus. Choroid plexus lines the boundary of these ventricles. And there are three distinct anatomical locations for the choroid plexus. First, the choroid plexus of lateral ventricle, which are lining the lateral ventricles. The choroid plexus of diencephalon, or the choroid plexus which is situated at the roof of the third ventricle. And lastly, the choroid plexus of the hindbrain, which is situated into the fourth ventricle. Now, all of these choroid plexus have an overall similarity that all of them have the epithelial cell and innervated by several blood vessels. But in terms of molecular heterogeneity, they are pretty different from each other. And they have unique set of genes which are expressed, which are important for their functional attribute. But we are not going to go that much details in this overview. It turns out that choroid plexus and its function to produce CSF and many other associated functions are pretty much conserved throughout uh, many species, especially the rodents, the primates and higher primates. Now let's look at the developmental timeline of all of these choroid plexus. So the first choroid plexus to develop is the hindbrain choroid plexus or the fourth ventricle choroid plexus. Followed by the fourth ventricle choroid plexus, the lateral ventricle choroid plexus develop almost simultaneously. And the last choroid plexus to develop is the hindbrain choroid, is the diencephalonic choroid plexus or the third brain choroid plexus, third ventricle choroid plexus. Now choroid plexus has blood supply and this blood supply to the lateral ventricle choroid plexus comes from carotid and the middle cerebr cerebral artery. Whereas the posterior choroidal artery supplies blood to both the lateral ventricle choroid plexus and the diencephalic choroid plexus. And the posterior inferior cerebellar artery supplies blood to the hindbrain choroid plexus. Now let's look at the signaling pathway 
how choroid plexus development takes place, the signaling mechanism behind it. So choroid plexus development is pretty interesting because from the stem cells, choroid plexus develop in one hand side, which is majorly epithelial in nature. And on the other hand side, there is development of the neuron, which is a different lineage. The question is how this lineage is bifurcated and how this lineage is maintained because choroid plexus epithelia sits like an island in a sea of neurons. So how the epithelial identity is maintained and the neural identity is suppressed is a big question. It turns out several signaling molecules such as bone morphogenetic protein, BMP, WINS, etc. give important signaling cues which allow these progenitors to become epithelial in nature. But if you don't have BMP signaling, then an alternative fate is chosen. Instead of becoming a choroid plexus epithelium, it becomes a neuron instead. So this is how we understand that the development of the choroid plexus is finely orchestrated by morphogen signaling. Now in human, choroid plexus, choroid plexus development takes place from GW5 to gestational week 12. And in this term, choroid plexus grow in size as the age progress. For example, here you look at an embryo of GW12. Here you can see the choroid plexus is pretty big and spanning all around the ventricle, almost occupying all the real estate inside the lateral ventricles. Now, we come to the cell types that are present in the choroid plexus. Though choroid plexus is majorly made up of epithelial cells, there are many other cell types. Of course, there are epithelial cells, but there are pericytes, endothelial cells, macrophages, and even neurons. Neurons constitute very less amount, like 5% of the total cell types present in the choroid plexus, and they come from the nearby rafe nucleus, and this is still hypothetical, and not much evidences are there. But neurons are present in the choroid plexus. Anyway, let's look at the cytoarchitecture of the choroid plexus. All of these cells are ciliated and they are epithelial in nature. They are cuboidal. Their nucleus is basally placed. And in between them, there are adherence junction, there are tight junction, which forms the blood CSF barrier, ensuring the substances which are leaking from the blood cannot enter the CSF and this is the epithelial barrier. The endothelial cells of the blood vessels, they are loosely packed and they are not packed by tight junction. So, so they are pretty much leaky in nature. But all the tight junction proteins such as occludin, collodin, zona occludens, etc. ensures that nothing can move from the blood to the CSF and the backward flow is also prevented. And this is how the choroid plexus, choroid plexus forms the blood CSF barrier and protecting our brain from the harmful effect of uh, several metabolite, toxic metabolites or other pathogens. Now CSF production takes place in the choroid epithelial cell and the key proportion or the key portion of the CSF is actually water and that water is secreted and the water is actually a filtrate of the blood. Now, the blood cannot be directly secreted into the CSF because the blood cannot move through these tight junctions. So, there are several ion channels present in the epithelial cells which allow ionic and water transport. These ion channels include sodium, potassium, chlorine, bi bicarbonate co-transporters, bicarbonate co-transporters, potassium channels, etc. But major ones are the sodium potassium ATPAs, aquaporin water channel which secretes the water into the CSF and KCC4 potassium channel which is a potassium and chloride co-transporter. All of these are present in the apical side whereas in the basolateral side there are other anion exchanger and bicarbonate exchanger present. So all the epithelial cells of the choroid plexus has a epicobasal polarity and this is very important in terms of CSF production. So now once, once we looked at the machinery of the CSF production Let's move on to understand what happens if the choroid plexus produces too much CSF or what happens if the CSF volume increases. One of the patho pathological situations is hydrocephalus, where the ventricular volume is increased dramatically and it leads to 
huge cranial pressure in those and it is pretty much common in many infants in that case there are specific ventricular shunts which are used to drain excess fluid from the ventricles other than that in case of patients of ep epilepsy who are having seizures or in case of person who is having alzheimer disease their csf has distinct biomarkers or their csf composition is very different from a normal csf so csf can be also a source of biomarkers and detection of many diseases so that is how csf is a very important uh, body fluid i would say not only these kind of neurodegenerative diseases but in case of bacterial fungal and viral infection the the appearance of the csf the protein content glucose content etc changes so looking at the, comp the composition of the csf one can predict what type of disease has happened that is why csf composition is very important and testing csf is widely accepted in the medical community other than that choroid plexus has a role to play in circadian rhythm which is revealed very very recently and many other interesting and intriguing function of the choroid plexus are yet to be revealed so i hope you enjoyed this video about choroid plexus and cerebrospinal fluid which is a neurophysiology video so if you like this video give it a quick thumbs up don't forget to like share and subscribe thank you guys for thanks for listening